I am delighted and proud to open the conference What Works for Borderline Personality Disorder. Do you know the saying, don't treat more than one or two borderline patients in your practice? It reflects the intense feeling evoked among therapists of borderline patients, the need to cope with the patient's infringements of boundaries, risk-taking, and suicide ideation and behavior. The psychiatric definition for BPD has existed for nearly 100 years and has been undergoing adjustments and changes since the term was first suggested. Recently, with the publishing, with the publishing of DSM-5, the question has been raised again. Should the disorder be conceptualized dimensionally or categorically? The diagnostic deliberation in regard to BPD resonate in a way with what is taking place nowadays in the field of psychotherapy. Different ways of looking at the same phenomena from different angles can enrich the, its understanding on the one hand, but on the other hand can become a bone of contention with each party, uh, with each party to this debate holding on to its own truths regarding the phenomenon. Many among the people in this hall are familiar with the tensions that exist in the field of psychotherapy. In some university training program, the teaching of the psychoanalytic thought is practically completely abandoned, and in certain analytical institutes, the assessment of therapeutic effectiveness is relinquished. The struggle for the truth is also reflected in ongoing attempts to define what is a psychotherapist, what training is required in psychotherapy programs, and so on. Therefore, when Ilan uh, Diamant and Yoav Broshi told me about the preliminary, their preliminary talk with Perry Hoffman, I thought that the collaboration between all of us can be a great opportunity to create a professional dialogue. As we at the Magid School of Psychotherapy conduct a three-year uh, dynamically oriented training program. In our discussions about this conference's agenda, we realized that we would like to bring forward, express, and discuss the most relevant up-to-date elements in the field of training BPD. The conference agenda reflects a more general agenda, which is to promote a frank and open professional dialogue among various therapeutic approaches. For each of the five therapeutic approaches presented in this conference, we invited one of its most prominent speakers to describe and discuss its features and advantages. In addition, on three occasions during the conference, we will conduct an open conversation between a speaker for a specific therapeutic approach and a, a senior psycho and senior psychotherapist to ascribe to similar or different theoretical approach. To conclude, I would like to thank all of my talented and visionary partners. I would like to thank Perry, Ilan, and Yoav with whom I worked together on this idea for many months. I would like to thank all of the conference participants, lecturers, debaters, and the actress for their ardent and uncompromising commitment to the lectures and discussions. It is not simple when you practice with a certain orientation to place yourself in a truly inquisitive and open position vis-a-vis -vis a different therapeutic approach. The willing, willingness of the conference participants to do so is not obvious, and I thank you all for the opportunities and possibilities you opened by that for all of us. And finally, a big thank you goes to the entire Magid Institute that so many of its staff members came together to bring this conference about from all its aspects. I would especially like to thank Yakir Segev, the General Director, for his ongoing support. Maya Oron, the conference coordinator, without her we wouldn't be here. Maya Tzole, who joined in on the organization and assisted it greatly. You're not the marketing director, those working at the call center and in the finance division, and all the others that contributed to the conference in the current form. I would also like to thank my family for the patience and generosity they exhibited during the past few weeks. And now I would gladly like to call Dr. Perry Hoffman. Perry is the president and co-founder of the National Education Alliance for 
borderline personality disorder, Perry conducted the, the landmark study on families and B BPD, documenting the importance of family emotional involvement in patients' recovery. She is a co-designer of the 12-week psychoeducation course for families and the co-editor of the books Understanding and Treating Borderline Personality Disorder, A Guide for Professionals and Family Members, and Borderline Personality Disorder, Meeting the Challenges to Successful Treatment. Perry. Thank you, and it's just a pleasure to be here. As I sit down and look and see how many people are in this audience, it's overwhelming to think that this conference that was just a dream a year ago is now a reality. We've actually changed the name of the conference. This is now the first annual conference on borderline personality disorder in Israel. I'd like to also thank, as Enid did, all the people that were involved to make this conference possible. The original planners, um, the people who then joined Magid Institute, our presenters who have come here on their own time, and all of you also who are here today to hopefully benefit from what we have to offer. Borderline personality disorder is a disorder that has seen a sea change over the last 20 years. It used to be thought of as a disorder that was not treatable, people would never recover. More recently, it's been called the good prognosis diagnosis, and people do recover. Actually, I often tell patients when I work with them and they come in and say, do I have borderline personality disorder? I say, I hope you do because it's one of the few psychiatric disorders where people can recover and get out of the mental health system. Other disorders are lifelong disorders. I've been asked to, to talk also about our organization. It's called the National Education Alliance for Borderline Personality Disorder. It was started 12 years ago, uh, three weeks before 9-11, 25 miles away from where 9-11 occurred. And it was started by four family members, two consumers, and a mental health professional. And the goal of the organization was really to be to, be, to develop a voice on the disorder. It was not a disorder that was taken under our national organization for mental illness. And what we decided was that we were gonna first focus on families and see if we could help families in their journey of helping their loved ones. The first thing we did was hold a conference. We held it at Columbia University. And similar to the conference here, it was a risk. We didn't know five people would come or 500 people. And that conference turned out to be a great success and was one of, the, was the first of 55 conferences we have since held. This has been over the 12, the 12 year span. We've gotten two grants from our government to host conferences. They paid for eight of those conferences. We leveraged that money into the 55 conferences. And part of what allows us to do that is that we're an all volunteer organization. So nobody draws a salary from our organization and every, every manpower is done um, from love and, and passion to help people with this disorder. For those of you who are not familiar at all of what we do, please do go on our website, which is an easy one to remember, borderlinepersonalitydisorder.com. And what you'll see there are over 150 audio and videos um, from conferences, from the 50 call-ins that we do weekly on a Sunday night. Everything is for free. You can download it. We hear that professors across our country are using the call-ins and, and resources on our website to use in their classrooms to help educate people on the disorder. One of the other things that we do, and we're very proud to be doing it, and thanks to Dr. Ken Silk, who is here today, is that we every year we go at the American Psychiatric Association and we do a course just for residents, people in medical school who are in their residency. Because one of the most important things uh, that we all need to work on is the stigma that surrounds this disorder. It's a disorder, as Enid said, where people were told to not have w only one or two people with the disorder in their practice, but we know it's a treatable disorder. And with people who are trained how to work with people with BPD, people do get better. So if we, we need to start with the people it, beginning in the field and edu re educate them on the disorder and that it is a hopeful disorder. So I leave you with that. Two things I, we learned from our tour guide when he heard about our conference. He said, well, interesting you're doing a conference on borderline when this is the land of borders. And also he taught us the word for hope, which is the mission of our 
um, organization, which is TICFA. So we hope that you enjoy these two days, and we look forward to hopefully working with you and maybe setting up NEABPD Israel. Thank you. Boker Tov. Good morning. I'm Ilan Diamant, representing the Israeli Center for Mentalizing in this conference. It has all begun when Dr. Perry Hoffman called me about a year ago. Her wish as a president of, as a, as a president of the NEA BPD was to organize an international conference in Israel dedicated entirely to building better lives to people affected by BPD. Last week, in one of, of our correspondences, she wrote, a dream has come true. We all feel excited about it, hoping that our endeavor will make us somehow better clinicians. We have decided to focus this conference on the well-structured manual evidence-based practices that provide the clinician with the capacity to systematically respond at any point of time to the question, how do I go about deciding what to do now? I hope that this conference will also help to bridge the gap among the three supposedly different models. Supposedly, since I believe that we all share some commonalities that I hope we could unravel in these two days, the wish to bridge the gap has already become true thanks to Dr. Enat Aspler, director of Magid School of Psychotherapy. The main ethos of Magid School of Psychotherapy is to enhance psychoanalysis knowledge among clinicians. In this conference, Magid School of Psychotherapy opens the door for other psycho psychotherapeutic models to be explored. And I thank her for that. A few words about us, the Israeli Center for Mentalizing. It was established 10 years ago, aiming at expanding recognition and implementation of MBT, that is mentalizing-based treatment, in public mental health services and private practices. Together, with uh, Dr. Ifat Cohen, uh, director of the OFEC Institute for DBT, we will launch the Wide Circle project on Sunday. Those of you who will not attend the conference on Sunday can learn about it from a flyer inserted in your file holder. Now lastly, I wish to welcome you all who gathered here this Friday morning, giving up their routine preparation for the Shabbat for all their free time, having time with their partners, seeing patients or whatever, I wish that some of your expectations are met. Now our conference, our conference is quite tightly scheduled. We'll start every session on time. Please do your best and take your seats before due time. And now, without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker this morning, Dr. Ken Silk. <laughs> Dr. Silk is a professor at the Department of Psychiatry, University of Michigan Medical School, since 1986. He has been director of the Personality Disorders Program. He was associate chair, clinical and administrative affairs for 10 years for the department and was the second chair of the faculty group practice executive board of the University of Michigan Health System. He has published more than 100 scientific articles and book chapters. He edited biological and neurobehavioral studies of borderline personality disorder and biology of personality disorders in the APA's annual review of psychiatry. Ken also co-authored with Alan Tessman and Michelle Reba, the doctor-patient relationship in pharmacotherapy, improving treatment effectiveness. He is co-editor with Peter Tyrer of the Cambridge Textbook of Effective Treatments in Psychiatry, a pocket edition of that book, of that textbook, also co-edited with Peter Tyrer, Effective Treatments in Psychiatry, and it was published by Cambridge University Press in 2011. He is one of the three co-editors in chief of the Journal of Personality and Mental Health and is on the editorial board of the Journal of Personality Disorders and Psychopathology in Berlin. He is a member of the international editorial board of the British Journal of Psychiatry. 
Ken is past secretary, secretary treasurer of the International Society for the Study of Personality Disorders and past president of the Michigan Psychiatric Society. He is past chair of the scientific program committee for the annual meeting of the American Psychiat Psychiatric Association. Dr. Silk has done PET research studying MU opioid receptor activation in patients with BPD. His early work explored sexual abuse in patients with BPD and its impact on object relations as measured through psychological testing. His primary interest is in the clinical treatment, both pharmacologic and as well as psychosocial of personality disorders, primarily borderline personality disorders. Ken, can you come? Thank you. Shalom. It is uh, very exciting to be here. Uh, this began with a phone call for, uh, that uh, uh, Perry and I had, or maybe it was an email saying, who do you know in Israel? And I said, well, I'm sure I have a lot of relatives, but I don't know if I really know anybody in particular. I actually uh, do know uh, a number of people here. But to uh, come here and to see this uh, idea that began with a brief email turn into this is... Uh, almost overwhelming, so thank you for being here. Uh, so at least in the United States we have to uh, say what all of our relationships with uh, possible commercial interests are and that's where they are. The only thing that would really involve anything would be the consultant with a uh, pharmaceutical company uh, and that had to do with a, a possibility of developing a drug for uh, borderline personality disorder, the treatment of, and I'll talk a little bit about the drugs tomorrow afternoon. It won't impact anything that I say today or, or tomorrow for that matter. So in trying to think about what it is that I would uh, talk about this morning, because since borderline personality disorder was officially part of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the APA in 1980. There's probably been 7,000 scientific articles written, and obviously in 45 minutes, um, it's hard to kind of bring that down to a couple of unique points. So what I thought that I would do is give a brief history with the idea of trying to focus on the concept of treatment and how people were thinking about the disorder and how their thoughts about the disorder may have led to the various effective treatments that you will see discussed and demonstrated here today. And, and that's probably 10% of what's been um, thought about, discussed, written about, uncovered about borderline personality disorder, but that's going to be my focus. But those of you who know me, it's very hard for me to stay on a topic, so I'm going to take some little um, corners and try and elaborate on a few things that I think, are, I think are important. And in looking at the books on the, uh, on the table there, it's, it's clear to me that the, the psychoanalytic, psychodynamic tradition is very strong here. So I probably, this is probably redundant of things that you've heard from many people here uh, in your training. But the first mention of borderline was in 1940. It was 1938 by Stern um, when he began to talk about the pe people who seemed to occupy the space between the neuroses and psychoses. And those were in the days when we were permitted to use the word neuroses. I'm not so sure that we're permitted to use that as frequently. And the idea that, that these were people who could dip into psychoses and dip in briefly, but that they would recover from psychoses still led people to think about the disorder as related to the psychotic disorder, so I'm going to say a cognitive disorder. And a series of papers came through in the um, 1940s, the as if uh, personality disorder that Helena Deutsch talked about, ambulatory schizophrenia. Um, I'm not quite sure what that is. I always think of that might be related to walking pneumonia. But, um, and then the borderline states that Robert Knight talked about in 1952, 
who was, and he was at the Menninger Clinic, and I'm sure that most of you probably know about that. A very interesting paper was written by James Forsh in 1964 on the psychotic char character, because I think that this is really an, an important thing, and I still debate this with my colleagues, that though patients with borderline personality disorder may experience moments of psychosis, they never forget that the moments of psychosis that they're experiencing are abnormal. So that, so that they never lose the ability to test what's real and not real, even if they are experiencing something that for them could be perceived of as psychotic. And I, I think that that's important from a therapeutic point of view. And one doesn't want to rush off and to put them into a purely psychotic character, a psychotic category, but you could also appreciate that uh, the stuff that they were talking about at that point in time, or 25 years before that, um, c clearly the issue of where do these folks fit in with respect to psychosis. But that idea, as you will probably uh, see, or you probably know, but you'll probably hear over the next uh, couple of days, that the idea, was this a cognitive disorder? Was this really something about how people thought about things, a, 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 almost a thought disorder? Or was this a disorder of emotion and, as we will see, emotion regulation? And so, just for instructional purposes, we can say that the pendulum swung and people would then think of this as more of a disturbance of emotions rather than a disturbance of thought. And, you know, it's neither one, of course. That the idea that we, our thoughts don't affect our emotions or our emotions don't affect the ability of our, our own ability to think about the options of how to interpret other people's behaviors or the behaviors around us I mean, obviously, each one of those things feeds back on each other, and you will hear again over the next couple of days how those things play out and how those things are thought about in terms of treatment. But the idea shifted with uh, um, Schmittenberg's uh, paper on stably unstable, that being unstable was the stable state of things. And I think that most of you who get into struggles with borderline patients realize that the, one of the things that's very important with these folks is that you can go from crisis to crisis to crisis to crisis, but, ne but no work ever gets done. Because you're always putting out fires, dealing with the next crisis. But if you step back and say, well, maybe the instability is part of the stability, is who they are, then let's deal with the instability, not with the crisis, but let's deal with the instability, once again, the kind of emotion dysregulation. And I think you will hear again, over the next couple of days, uh, therapies that really try to deal with the instability, to give people what I think of as some perspective on what is the emotional ups and downs that they're feeling and the way that those emotional ups and downs uh, affect how they think about themselves and how they think about the, the world, or you can say the other way around, how they think about themselves and how they think about the world impacts their ability to experience emotions in a consistent or inconsistent way. Again, they all kind of feed back on one another, but I think to have a structured way of performing therapy, of dealing with therapy, at least keeps you more stable, even when the patient isn't so stable. And one of the problems we have as therapists is how do we say stay stable when there seems to be so much chaos in the patient around us? And the one thing we try to do is you can't have two chaotic people in the room. I mean, you, you know, I'm Jewish. I know what it's like to have two chaotic people in a room. Believe me, you know. I mean, I always say that, you know, I'm a fourth generation anxiety neurotic, and most of you know what I mean. So, the idea of emotional instability began with Schmittenberg. Uh, you folks, I'm sure, are familiar with uh, 
um, Kernberg, who talked about emotional instability, but in the concept of object relations. But if you don't have a consistent sense of yourself, and I'll leave that to Frank to talk more eloquently about it than I'm able to talk about, if you don't have any consistent sense of yourself, then it's hard to have a consistent sense of your emotions, your reactions, and your relationships to other people. And, and in saying that, we all know when we're stressed, that our, sense, our own sense of our own object relationships are not so stable, right? But fortunately, that only happens with relatives and in work and in other kinds of situations, we're a little more calm. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here today. And, and then Grinko was the, actually the first person who did, I thought, was systematic research in the concept of borderline personality disorder. And uh, he published a wonderful book in 1968 uh, with two colleagues called the Borderline Syndrome and divided it into four different groups of borderlines, one of those groups being um, what we might now call the true borderline group. So the thinking then moved more in terms of regulation of emotions rather than cognitive distortions. But I think, again, having been raised in the psychoanalytic uh, tradition myself, that, you know, to, to me, it, all of this is really rooted about in how consistently you think about yourselves, yourself and how consistently you think about the people around you. And whether that's cognitive or whether that's emotional, I, I think that that's a a fine line to, to draw. So what about the current diagnosis of, of which there's been a lot of sores recently? And, and I was the, uh, I was a consultant, you'll love this story, I was a consultant to the uh, DSM-5 work group for the American Psychiatric Association for the group on personality, the study of personality and personality disorders. You know, and I got called in because the group of experts wasn't getting along. <laughs> so what's new? But I must say that by the time I got there, everything had, had, had calmed down. Um, and, uh, and it was a very interesting uh, process. But the, the current diagnosis, I, I would like to say, began with a paper by uh, John Gunderson and Margaret Singer in uh, the 1975 American Journal of Psychiatry. It's actually the first article of, of that particular year of 1975. And the concept of Gunderson and Singer was kind of strengthened when the, uh, they developed a, an interview called the Diagnostic Interview for Borderlines. And we were actually, my group was, uh, our first publication was in the test for test reliability of the Diagnostic Interview for Borderlines. And, even, and that eventually culminated in the 1980 uh, Borderline Personality Disorder being put into the dsm 3 and, and there was a big argument about whether that diagnosis ought to be in or not, whether it was real, whether it was pure, whether it was right, whether it was wrong. And, and I thought that that was, as an expression, angels dancing on the head of a pin. You know, a, a lot of noise about something. And, and it doesn't matter whether they were right or wrong, but I often think about, uh, I mentioned, you know, thousands of papers have been published since 1980, and I think about what we've learned about this disorder, whatever it is you want to call it, we would never have learned if the diagnosis hadn't become official, whatever an official diagnosis is. So I, I think that that was a great decision, though there are still people who think that that was wrong. But in dsm 3 the concept of borderline personality disorder as a syndrome and it became separated from schizotypal personality disorder to go back to the idea that did borderline sit on the edge of psychosis? Was this a cognitive disorder versus was this an emotional disorder? There's a great paper in 1979, Crossing the Border, um, by uh, Bob Spitzer, uh, and it's a terrific paper. Um, what's interesting is this concept of the cognitive um, distortion that brief psychotic episode distortion that was in the, um, it was put into schizotypal personality disorder in DSM-3 
it was removed in DSM-3R and it was put into DSM-4 borderline personality disorder as the ninth criterion. And we did, not that we thought we were doing it when we did it, but we did a study to show w that the psychosis was probably related to um, severe depressive affect and stress and didn't belong in schizotypal personality disorder. And when you left the, the distorted uh, cognitive distortions in schizotypal, you had a 75% overlap between borderline personality disorder and schizotypal. When you pulled it out and then put it in borderline, you had a 15 to 20% overlap. And so there it re remains uh, because we still have DSM-4 as DSM-5. Um, So these were the Gunderson and Singer criteria, um, the, and they're quite similar to what we see today. Uh, intense affect, usually depressive or hostile, um, impulsive behavior, a s certain social adaptiveness, and that gets broken up into different criteria in the DSM-3, that brief psychotic experiences. Um, loose thinking and in structured situations, that had to do with when they gave uh, psychological testing, the statement was that borderlines looked pretty cognitively intact on things like the TAT and early memories, but when you gave them raw shocks, that they looked very disorganized. Well, we did, uh, it was mentioned by Alain that we did some studies in terms of sexual abuse, object relations, and, and psychological testing. And, and what was really interesting is the concept of borderline personality disorder looked kind of crazy on things like the Rorschach was based upon six studies. For 25 years, people quoted that same paper. So um, if you've got a thesis to write, go back and look at the Rorschach. There's a lot of material that people haven't looked at there. Um, and then relationships that vacillate between transient superficiality and uh, dependency, intense dependency. And that gets manifested in, in what are the interpersonal relationships. So if you think about the number seven, chronic feelings of emptiness or um, one, frantic efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment, uh, a pattern of intense and unstable interpersonal relationships, all of those are kind of, I think, uh, broken out from Gunderson and uh, Singer's of the uh, interpersonal, uh, the dependency and superficiality. So it gets kind of broken down, but this is uh, in DSM-5, it's DSM-4-TR because um, there is no change in, in DSM-5. But let me just, for a second, and this is one of these diversions, I want to touch a little bit on DSM-5. I, I want to touch on it because I, I do think that the ideas of the work group and the idea that we will move towards a more dimensional uh, diagnosis for uh, borderline personality disorder will probably occur in the next um, 10 years. I, I don't know that for sure. I think that the work group thought that their proposal would be accepted it's now in section three of, uh, um, of the DSM-5, so it's the, I don't know what, proposals that need further work, I guess is how it's described. But I think it's useful because, because there's a tremendous amount of research that's now being done trying to validate some of the concepts that the folks in proposed for DSM-5. So you'll be reading a lot about it. Uh, I'm going to take a, a, a bit of time only because it's a bit complicated, which I think is one of the reasons why um, it didn't uh, make it. But there were lots of political forces that led to it not making it also. So the DSM-5, how do you know a person has a personality disorder and you start off by that? Because if you decide that they don't, you can forget all the rest of the stuff. Saves you a lot of time. Um, and they define personality problems as having to do with how we think about and relate to ourselves and others. That goes back to the idea of the object relations. No different. And how does one think about the self? How do we think about ourselves as a consistent integrated entity? Um, 
and, and do we have persistent goals and do we move in a reasonably steady way towards the achievement of those goals. And then the interpersonal one uh, aspect of our capacity to be empathic, our capacity to sustain intimate relationships with other people, so not getting so angry that you think they're the worst person, you know, that kind of interpersonal uh, um, idealization and devaluation. The inter and how do we integrate the representation of others? Nobody's going to always be towards us, in relationship to us, in the way we would like them to be. So are they really just a rotten person? Because, you know, they gave me mashed potatoes instead of french fries. I mean, what is it, you know? And, and you'll hear Frank talk about this in terms of object relations, but you'll also hear Peter Fonagy talk about this in, uh, on Sunday morning when one talks about mentalization-based therapy. And, um, and you'll hear Alan talk about that when, when we talk a little bit about the, um, well, I always think about it in the chain analysis, which is let's stop and figure out what's going on here and let's figure out what's real and let's figure out what's your emotional kind of overlay and interpretation of what may be an event that's really not the way you perceive it. So that if they possibly have a personality disorder, then these are the dimensions or the domains in which uh, we might find, uh, if you want to say, symptoms or behaviors related to personality. And the domains include uh, negative emotionality, and you can see uh, how that's defined. And the facets would be the individual traits that go into the domains. So negative emotion, emotional ability, anxiousness, submissiveness, detachment, uh, facets, uh, social withdrawal, antagonism, disinhibition, or compulsivity. They haven't figured out yet whether those are separate domains or simply different sides of the same coin. It's a, it's an actu it, actually, it's an interesting debate of which I heard too many hours, but um, it, it's something that they're still working on. And there's psychoticism. We've, we've not kind of forgotten about, about that, and, and that's important because I've got a talk on Sunday, of course, that you'll all stay to it for at the end, and we'll talk about uh, psychopharmacology. Okay. So, and, and you notice that the, it wasn't borderline disorder, it had to do with types, and this has to do with the issue again of categorical or dimensional, and everybody, there was a lot of, I mean, obviously a lot of emotion, and uh, emotionality and emotion dysregulation that took place in the committee. Um, I don't know, they, you're probably all too young. There was a wonderful movie, uh, um, maybe not so one, Dr. Strangelove with, with Peter Sellers. And there's a great scene in there when they're about to send the planes over to Russia and the Russian ambassador's there. And, there's a big discussion with George, George C. Scott, who, who was chewing gum, and, um, and he goes, and Peter Sella plays the Russian ambassador. At that, I think that at that time, somebody does, I don't remember. And so they're going to show him the map, and he says, you're going to show him the map. And they begin to argue, and they say, you can't fight in here, it's the war room. Huh? And that's what I thought about, you know, the DSM-5 group, right? We're studying interpersonal dysregulation and nobody's getting along. It's perfect. <laughs> so that, um, so th th it's d diagnosed by a kind of an initial statement um, that has to really do with how they would look on that self and interpersonal uh, rating that I uh, presented at first. Okay, instability of self-image, personal goals, interpersonal relationships and affects accompanied by marked impulsivity, risk-taking, and hostility. Characteristic difficulties are apparent in identity, self-direction, empathy, and our intimacy, along with, now we're back to those traits, negative affectivity, antagonism, and disinhibition. And it was interesting to me that everybody made a big deal about it because if you go through the rest, it's just the same as the dsm 4 Criteria, it's just arranged in terms of domains. You know, but I'm an academic and huge fights have to do with titles and what you're called and this and that. 
So it makes sense that there would be this fight amongst academics. So empathy can't recognize the feelings and needs of others associated with interpersonal hypersensitivity. Um, perceptions of others are selectively biased towards negative attributes or vulnerabilities. Intimacy intense, unstable, and conflicted close relationships marked by mistrust, neediness, and anxious preoccupation with real or imagined abandonment. Close relationships often viewed in extremes. Again, it's the same thing. It's just put into these dimensions. Then depressivity, an aspect of negative affectivity, frequent feelings of being down. I'm going to jump ahead. Impulsivity, an aspect of disinhibition. Uh, we know what that is. Risk taking, an aspect again of impulsivity or disinhibition. Engagement in dangerous behaviors. And hostility, that's the one antagonism one. Okay. From where I stand, I don't care what you call it, and I don't really care what, how you define it, because all of you who are clinicians know one when you see one. Because you feel it. You know, when Perry and I walked into this room, or well, when I saw Perry last night, I felt something. <laughs> it was really terrific. It was really terrific to see this come about, okay? And you have feelings when you see patients. You know, I always say to my residents who are in the emergency room, if you see a patient and after the first five minutes you want to marry them or murder them, they're a borderline. <laughs> and it doesn't matter the gender. It could go either way. <laughs> Sexual orientation doesn't matter. But it's true. And again, I want to loop back on this idea that with these structured therapies that hopefully you will hear about over the next two days, is some way to manage, should I kill them or should I run away with them, feelings, so that you keep yourself more objective. And, it, and it, believe me, it's, it's really, really hard to, to stay that way. So don't think for a second that, that we who practice the therapy, as do you, um, we, we have any particular uh, expertise. I mean, I was talking to um, folks who run the program out in uh, Venice, California, Los Angeles, California, on borderline personality disorder. And, and I've, been, I've taken courses in MVT as well as in DBT and, and was trained uh, um, psychodynamically. Um, you know, I, I would never be able to treat a borderline patient unless I had a group of colleagues that I could sit around and talk to and with about those patients. And I could feel that I could be honest about what it is that I'm feeling and that they could be honest back to me. It's crucial. You can't do this alone. It's much too hard to do alone. You have to have somebody that you can just unload on. I have a, a, a good friend, uh, Joanne Heap, who I've been working with for tw 25 years, and, and one day I, I, I called her up, we were talking about something, and I said, how are you? She said, you know that patient, the one I was on the phone with all week long, you know what she did? She wound up taking an overdose of Elevil, uh, amitriptyline, a tricyclic antidepressant, and she's in the medical intensive care unit. I said, oh, that's terrible. She says, I don't ever want to see her again. You know, the heck with her, I'll get the consult service to come in, they'll find a new therapist for her, I'm done with her. And she talked for 10 minutes, and then I said, so what are you really going to do when you see her? <laughs> okay, but if you don't have a colleague that you can say, I don't want to see her again, I don't want to do anything, let her drive somebody else crazy, I've been doing this, she took up all my time last week. If you can't talk to somebody about that, and you have to keep that inside you, that's not going to help you be an effective therapist the next time you see the patient. Whether you're going to keep the patient or not keep the patient is really not as important as being able to manage your feelings. So 
to me, all this stuff are angels dancing on the head of a pin. Because what really is, yep, good. So what really is important is that uh, y you have to, as I said before, you can't have two chaotic people in the room. It just doesn't help. But again, we don't have any special ability to not be chaotic ourselves, but these therapies will, will help us. They will be aids to us in trying to keep a better emotional balance in what is a, t a terribly difficult, um, emotionally upsetting thing. Because these are real people with real problems who have a unique ability to express their pain, a unique ability to express their pain to us. And I think part of the difficulty is it's almost too painful for us to believe that life can be so painful for them. And it seems so crazy that it's so painful for the, to them. But believe me, they're not manipulating that, you. This is how they feel. And as Lenahead would say, and they're doing the best that they can. Not very good, but it's the best that they can. And to be able to keep that in your mind makes you, I think, a better therapist. So their problems still exist. We still have the problems. And they come to our office. We can't lock the door and keep them up. So we have specialized th psychotherapeutic treatments. I don't know why I put CBT twice. Um, <laughs> it was late at night. A and GPM is, is general psychiatric management or good psychiatric management, which is something that um, uh, John Gunderson and, um, and Paul Lynx and Sh uh, Shelley McMain, um, so Lynx and McMain are from Toronto, Lynx is now in, in uh, London, Ontario, and there's a book that's just being published by the APA on the good psychiatric management, and, and Perry said that uh, we do this uh, workshop um, at the APA with Brian Palmer in, and John Gunderson and Brian Palmer and I kind of rolled that out uh, to a group in Chicago in January, I don't know, January or November, but it, it's just been published by the APA Press. And STEPS is uh, de developed by Nancy Bloom from Iowa and it's an adjunct. You can add that on to any of these treatments. So we've done a lot in the therapy area. I'm going to talk about psychopharmacology tomorrow. You realize we haven't done very much. There's some hints, but they're only hints at best. But what's really important, and Perry's a, a major uh, power behind this, is to inform families and inform patients that this is what they have. And people are so afraid, you know, that the patient's going to decide to uh, re-interior decorate my office, if I should call her a borderline, without my permission, and so we don't do that. And yet, when you tell them, they feel relieved, because number one is you're being honest with them. And secondly, they know that they're not this depressed person, because if they were a depressed person, they would have been undepressed at least sometime. You know, some patients say, I've been depressed since the womb. You know, now major depression is an episodic illness. So if you've been depressed for the last 40 years, it's not major depression. Okay? And we're beginning to understand the connections in, in the brain as well. So who are these folks? 75% of them are women. They constitute about a quarter of the inpatient population, at least in the United States. 10 to 12 percent of the uh, clinic population and somewhere between one and a half and five percent of the general population. They use a lot of resources, uh, both um, psychiatric, psychological, as well as medical care. Um, and, um, and if I could say anything that we're discovering is that their prefrontal lobes don't inhibit their emotions. Their, their amygdala response. The amygdala is this little almond-shaped thing in the brain that, uh, that gives salience, that kind of measures how much significance should you give to an event. And if they're right about that, then you can appreciate the fact that if you're overreactive to something, then you're not giving something. You're, you're giving too much significance to little, little kind of things. You're making a megilla out of something. 
So, but there's a lot more that's going on psychobiologically, but that's important. And Harold Konigsberg done a wonderful job in looking at the, that these are folks that fail to habituate. So if you show them, uh, there's an international group of what I call disgusting pictures, you know? And so they give these pictures to people and they can measure their emotional response. And, and you give them an order, and as people begin to see the disgusting pictures after a while, their emotions decrease. Their, their electrical activity in their brain decreases. Borderlines, it doesn't. They don't. So there's a kind of way that, you know, their brains don't necessarily learn from exposure or experience. To some degree, and I don't mean exposure in an exposure behavioral way. And, um, the concept that uh, uh, satisfaction, opioid mechanisms, and attachment, oxytocin, and Peter Fonagy is the world's expert in attachment and oxytocin, as far as I'm concerned. There's a genetic component, but it remains unclear as to how much of the variance is uh, accounted for by generic, genetic factors, about 50%, um, particularly emotion dysregulation, but the whole issue is where's genes and where's environment? And obviously there's an interplay. The better the genes you have, you don't need to have such good luck. Okay? You got lousy genes, you need a lot of good luck. By good luck, I mean life experience. So, you know, if you can sign up, sign up both columns, the good luck column <laughs> and the good genes column. Push the other person aside and get in there. Okay? And the way Lenahan thinks about it is a constitutional predisposition, a genetic predisposition to emotion dysregulation. Something's wrong with those prefrontal lobes. Again, this is very simplistic. Uh, and a non-validating environment. That somehow your emotions are, are not validated as being real. They're your emotions. They may be crazy. They're yours. We don't determine what it is that we feel. We only feel. What we do in relationship to the feeling is where our responsibility is. But these are people who feel like that their feelings, the emotional reaction, the biological response that they have to situations has really been uh, invalidated. I'm going to skip that. So one can think about this in terms of dysregulations, emotion dysregulation, affective ability and anger, interpersonal behavior dysregulation, chaotic relationships and fears of abandonment, self-dysregulation, identity disturbance, and emptiness and loneliness. This is Marshall Lenihan's stuff, this is not mine. Uh, behavioral dysregulation, parasuicidal acts and impulsivity, and cognitive dysregulation, dissociative reactions, paranoid and other psychotic experiences. Now let me see how, I have about a minute and a half left, I want to... Okay. I may go a minute over. They can be comorbid with other diagnoses, but I want to talk about myths and then we'll finish up. So there's a whole set of myths that go on with borderline personality. They resist treatment. They're the most help-seeking group that we know, and they can exquisitely talk about how painful life is to them. They attack and are disrespectful to those that treat them. They're symptoms of interpersonal difficulty and emotion dysregulation. They're not manipulation. And they're going to be, they believe that their feelings and their experiences are going to be invalidated or denied by us, just like everybody else who's invalidated them, or at least how they've experienced life. They really improve, and just not true. Mary Zanarini, in her McLean study of adult development and the collaborative study uh, for, uh, collaborative longitudinal study for personality disorders, they're, they're pretty close together. They're 10% are better at six months, 25% by a year, 50% by two years, 80% by eight years. Now, at least Mary's data, she's got data up to 25 years. She's analyzed things up to 16 years. And if you look, one third go on to recover, to get better. And that means for two years, stability with ongoing reasonable success in an interpersonal, one interpersonal relationship and in either work or school. One third re remit and then get better, and one third um, fall back into uh, behaving like a borderline patient and seem to persist there. But it's a lot better than what anybody ever thought. 
They're threatening, they threaten suicide and put the therapist at risk. We're going to talk about structured therapies that focus on the self-destructiveness while minimizing the transference and counter-transference issues. And the issue of how you fuse the management of the affect and behavior in the treatment. I think you have to manage these folks. Because if you can't manage them, you can't treat them. You have to be able to get the chaos down to a certain level so they can sit still in one spot and appreciate all the wonderful and brilliant things we have to say. <laughs> and the myth that only experts uh, can successfully treat patients with, uh, with something like DBT or any of the uh, um, theories, the structured therapies, we'll see the structured therapies and we'll get some idea of what it takes to uh, be able to do this successfully, or at least less chaotically. So what does the future hold? Um, I think there'll be further refinement application of therapies, further refinement of neuroimaging work to appreciate the anatomical areas that are most dysregulated. We're beginning to be able to actually appreciate and study the activities of specific circuits within the brain. Uh, though I'm always worried that the computer, I hope that the computers that are analyzing all this data are right, and I always get worried. I'm still looking for the 100,000 or the 10,000 normals so we know the variation of what normal is, and I feel like that we're, we're, um, we're jumping ahead. And um, there's a book that was written by Sally Satel, I want to say it was Brainwashed, which is her, her talking about how this neuroimaging studies, studies are being used to, where's the love center, where's the hate center, and she thinks that we're, you know, decades away from the kinds of things that are being claimed. We're going to learn more about genetics, and I think in the next 10 years we'll have some better idea as to which group of people respond to which particular medication, and which ones might not. Um, and things like what Perry does, the, reducing the stigma attached to to this group of patients, not only in the world, I mean among the professionals who treat them. Because I still talk to people who say really just amazingly frightening things about, about these people. They're manipulative, they're no good, they're this and that. So no matter what we call them, or how we arrive at what it is, their patients who come to us, their complaints aren't going to change. They're not going to say, well, I have this dimensional complaint. No, last week I had a categorical complaint. They, the, uh, their profound pain in living and of living and their struggles to maintain and then undercut relationships and their fear of rejection, even when they reject outright, will re even and their fear, even when they're not rejected, will, is going to remain. And they'll still plead for treatment. And they and we will continue to struggle with them and their feelings within and throughout our treatments. Th that's true. And, and uh, you know, I, I wrote, I've done these papers and done these books. In my heart of hearts, I'm a clinician, always have been a clinician. Um, and, and to me, they come to us with their complaints. And we need to figure out ways, again, of doing the best that we can for them and not getting into having our feelings overtake us as their feelings overtake them. And I hope that over the next uh, two days you'll at least have an appreciation of three of the ways that the people have been thinking about them. And they're all very, very interesting and, and, and very exciting. So uh, I appreciate you all being here. I hope this gives you some kind of uh, background and uh, thank you for your attention. I need to disconnect here. Ken, thanks for your nice and inter interesting introduction this morning and uh, I thought that, that uh, through your introduction I could think about the, the present moment or the present problem that we, we struggle with these patients, you know, that how to stay non-chaotic with these dysregulated, emotionally difficult patients, which is the topic that we are going to discuss throughout this today. So thanks, Ken. Thank you. And now we go for a, yeah, yeah, give it, give it, give it.